The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, welcome to the Lenovo Scholar Network webinar. Um, I'm just going to give folks a few minutes to log on in case they're running late. Um, in about a minute or two, I will start and then I'll hand over to Krishna and Roy. But I'll just give it another minute or so. Let me know if anyone has trouble hearing me or seeing my screen. Um, there's a chat feature on the bottom that you can use as well. All right, I'm just gonna test my audio to make sure. Um, Evelyn, I said that you said you couldn't hear me, but I was on mute, so I just wanna make sure that you can hear me now. I can hear you loud and clear. This is Krishna and this arena. Okay, great. All right, I think we can get started. I'm gonna make sure we're recording this. Awesome. All right. Welcome everyone to year seven of the Lenovo Scholar Network. I'm really excited to be here and introduce our kickoff webinar with Krishnander Roy, a professor and department head at Valdosta University in Georgia. I'm just gonna speak for a few minutes and then I'll turn over to Krishnander who will be doing the bulk of the trainings and he'll also be leading the next 10 webinars. Um, but I just wanna make sure that I can introduce myself. My name is Serena Mathai. I'm the Corporate Engagement and Relations Manager at NAF. And I've been working at NAF for about six years now, but I've been working with the Lenovo Scholar Network for over the last year, and I know it's been a really interesting time and we're dealing with a lot of uncertainties, but I just want to make sure that everyone here knows that we're trying to do what we can to make sure this process is as smooth and uh, easy as possible for you guys. So definitely want to make sure you have the opportunity to ask questions and, you know, uh, really get engaged with us. We're here to help. Um, so with that, Here's some background on the Lenovo Scholar Network itself. You know, I want to also take a moment to recognize that we have 14 new academies that were entered into the network this past year. So congratulations to the new academies. Um, and that brings us to about 148 total academies with approximately 6,000 students across the network. So, you know, in seven years, we've definitely grown a lot and really amazed by all the amazing new apps that come out every year. Um, I'm always blown away by what our students can do, and it's definitely thanks to a lot of the work that all of you are doing right now. And just a reminder, you know, as part of the Lenovo Scholar Network, um, we have these webinars, which Prashanda will be leading through uh, February. Um, but we're also going to be doing a virtual teacher training on November 5th and 6th. Um, I'll be sending out the invites for you guys to RSVP shortly. It will be held on Zoom with uh, Prashandra Roy, as well as some other professors from MIT. And this year, we're also uh, getting um, some help from Mobile CSP, who's gonna kind of talk about how to teach this in a remote setting. Um, so I hope everyone can attend. You know, we are definitely looking, it's different than what we've done in the past. We usually try to do this in person, um, but I think this will allow us to get a lot of good one-on-one um, -on -one opportunities for people to ask questions and kind of see things happen as they go. Um, along with the, the trainings and the webinars, we also have a bunch of teacher resources that you should have received by email. Um, there's a, a handbook that if you have not received by email, let me know, or if you don't have access to the Google group, which I mentioned in the last bullet, also let me know. Um, the Google group is definitely 
the go-to place if you have questions, um, if you have comments, if you have ideas that you want to spring out. It's a, basically a messaging board for everyone in the Lenovo Scholar Network. So the great thing about that is that you can, you know, interact with teachers who've done this before, um, but also ask questions and see what answers people come up with. Um, it's also where I'll be posting updates and any other resources that might be relevant. And just a reminder, um, you know, once we get into the competition part, this is just how it will look like, you know, in, in March, we'll be having all the academies with a local level contest. Um, so you can basically use that as an opportunity to narrow down down to the two apps that will be submitted to the national contest. Um, and in the national contest, we have, you know, business partners come and review the apps and they'll use a scoring rubric to determine what ends up being the top five apps, which will be then determined as the winners. Um, and then, you know, typically those top five teams are, uh, will be represented at NAF Next, where we usually announce a fan favorite, which is done through an online voting through NAF Next. And these are some key dates. Um, a lot of these dates have been sent out in the teacher resources, but again, I'll post them to the Google group. Um, and I saw this, Bernadine, you mentioned that you need access, so I'll make sure your email's in there. Um, and again, you know, these are definitely dates that we're, fingers crossed, hoping stay the same, but obviously we're gonna be monitoring a lot of the, the circumstances and making sure that we can do what's best for, you know, your schools and your students. But for now, you know, we're planning on having the teacher training at the start of November and then have the March, October through March be most of the app development time. And then we're planning for mid-March to be when academies will start hosting their school level contests. And then April will be the online national app contest followed by the winning teams announced in May. And then the winning teams highlighted at NAF Next in July, which will be in Phoenix of this year. So with that, um, and I'll make these slides available in the Google group as well, um, but I wanna turn it over to Krishnandu, who will be going more into the technical side. Um, and you know, feel free to answer, ask any questions in the, in the, the bottom, or there's like a question section, but there's also a chat. Um, and just a reminder, this webinar is being recorded, and this year we're gonna upload all the webinars to a YouTube channel. Um, it's an unlisted YouTube playlist on the NAF page. So, we to make sure you have that link and I'll, I'll make sure that everyone gets that again. Um, and they'll be uploaded as soon as we can get the recording converted. Um, so if you ever need to, you know, find a, an older webinar recording, they'll all be in one place, um, which I hope makes things a lot easier this year. Great, uh, Krishnanda, with that, I will hand it over to you. All right, so Serena, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, so welcome everyone to the seventh year of the Lenovo Scholar Network for NAF, and my name is Krishnan Duroy. I am going to introduce myself first. I am a computer science professor and department head at Valdosta State University. It's a public university in the university system of Georgia. We are in South Georgia, and I have been teaching here for 11 years now, and I have been involved with App Inventor for close to, I think, 10 years now. So I do a lot of things with App Inventor at my university. I have taught a university course with App Inventor. I usually do summer camps during summer with App Inventor. And I also do this. And I've been involved with other App Inventor projects like the Verizon App Contest that used to run for several years. So this has been a really good learning experience for me. And I, I, I enjoy sharing my app inventor knowledge with you and your students and excited to see all the really cool apps and ideas that they have during the course of the year so let me first see if you guys can quickly introduce yourselves or not and i know some of you might be logged in using your phones some of you might be calling in use from a computer that doesn't have a microphone. So if you can, if you have a micro, I'm gonna unmute all of you right now, you all are muted. So I'm gonna unmute all of you. If you 
have a microphone, please share with us who you are, what school you represent, and if this is your first year, what are some of your hopes and dreams from this program this year? So I'm gonna unmute you, I'll unmute you all now, and wait and see what you have to say. Hi, um, this is Gloria Jimenez. Hey, Gloria. Um, I'm, hi, um, we are participating for Miami Southridge and uh, I have exposed my kids to MIT App Inventor uh, and I'm hoping to um, see if we can go deeper into it and see, uh, just interested to see what they can create and if they can, um, use this as a tool to, to learn the entire process from designing to, to publishing um, an app. Great, welcome. Good to hear. We will certainly go into some of the really higher level advanced topics of App Inventor over the course of this year. So looking forward to have you all. Good evening, hi. My name is Marco Dinez from South Dade Senior High School in Homestead, Florida. Um, this is my first year, I'm really excited. Um, basically, I teach gaming, but um, I'm an, I wanted this project because basically my students go into the community and our main thing is gaming or computer science for good. So I think this is a perfect fit for my school to teach the kids um, the importance of computer science and how to develop apps for the good of um, the community. So um, thank you, welcome. Um, I'm excited to be here. Welcome, Mark, glad you're here. Andrea, I think you are on mission. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Okay, can you hear me? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Andrea Hutchison, and this is our first year participating, and we are in Milpitas, California. Nice having you. Welcome. Thank you. Excited. Okay, my name is Michael Thomas. I teach at William H. Turner Technical Arts High School in Miami, Florida, and this is my first year with my students. Welcome, Michael. Hello, sir. How are you doing? Good. Lorena, you can go next. Hi, my name is Lorena um, Izzo. I'm from the Academy of Finance and Enterprise in Queens, New York. Um, I, this is going to be my fourth year, and um, I'm really excited to see what my students come up with um, this year for their apps. Awesome. So, how was your? If since this is going to be your fourth year, how was the experience? I'm sure last year's experience was weird with the pandemic, but what has your your experience been so far if you want to share something with the new teachers um well the the students come up with really great ideas um they love creating stuff um that you know they get to see that works and you know so they get very excited um because of all the hands on that you know that uh MIT app inventor you know gives them and you know, they just get to see their their ideas come to life, and that that's really great. And I'll I'll echo that. I have seen some really good ideas from students. All so I've been involved all seven years, and I've seen some really cool ideas and some really good work from students. They constantly surprise you. I'll also at the same time caution that some of the student ideas are really ambitious, and at times. You might have to be the bad person and say, you know what, that might be a little too challenging for the time that you have. Usually it's the time. The students can work really hard and given a lot of time, they might be able to achieve a lot, but you might have to scale that back a little bit. But I have some, I, I echo what uh, Lorena just said. It, it, it's it, it's going to be a rewarding experience for all of us. Let's see, is anyone else who, anyone, I'll wait for 30 more seconds and see if anyone else wants to introduce themselves. Uh, 
While we're waiting, can one of you please confirm that you can see my screen, which is like the MIT App Inventor? Yes. All right. Yes. Good. Yes, I can see. All right, then I'm going to go ahead and mute all of you back again. If you have a question, you can either type the question in the question box or you can raise your hand. As I'm speaking, I will stop once every five, 10 minutes or so and field questions. So I'm going to go ahead and mute you all so that there's no background noise. So App Inventor is a completely free software to design Android apps. It's completely browser-based. The easiest way I go to App Inventor is just, I just Google for it. I just go to Google. I just search for App Inventor. And the first hit, that's appinventor.mit.edu. That's where I go, and this is the main landing page. So MIT created App Inventor. Hal Abelson, he's a very famous computer science professor at MIT. He has done a lot of really good, cool stuff over many, many, many decades now. And he's a very famous computer science professor. His team developed this software with the goal to democratize programming and computer science knowledge through creating app. Now, you all routinely interact with young students, and I don't have to tell you all how glued our youths are now to mobile technology. They, have, they all have mobile devices, most of your students probably have Apple devices. So they all use mobile phones and tablets, smartphones all the time on a daily basis. And computer science is one of the key fields for many, many decades to come. I envision at some point in time Computer science knowledge, some point of time soon, computer science knowledge is going to be as fundamental as basic math knowledge is now. So right now, if you complete a high school degree, if you call, complete a college degree, you're expected to know certain math. I think very soon we are going to get to a point where computer science is going to be also a, a fundamental requirement for every level of education. So the goal of App Inventor was to expose our youth to programming and computational thinking through creating Android apps. Now, when I teach my college students programming, for example, I'm teaching introductory programming this semester itself, I constantly tell, tell them one thing, which is, when you're learning programming for the first time, you're learning two things at the same time, problem solving and programming. It's, it's kind of like writing a poem. So when you're writing a poem, you have to have an idea first and then you have to be able, you, you need to be able to express that idea in a language. Just like that, in programming, you have to have a solution to a problem, which is an idea, and then you have to be able to express that solution using programming language. And App Inventor is one such language geared specifically to novice learners. So when you come to the App Inventor website, in order to launch the app creator, on the very top left, you see this Create App button. And when you click on that, that's going to ask you for your Google username and password. So App Inventor is a web-based app design software. In order to access that, you either need a Google account that many, if your school is a Google school, 
that account for your students will work. If your school is not a Google school, they will have to have their own Gmail accounts. So once you log in, the first time you log in, you're going to see something different a little bit. Since I have already created many apps before, it's automatically taking me to the, to the last app that I was working on. Now, going back to the main page, the main page has a lot of details, all these main tiles. Those are important tiles that you and your students will need to start out with. So today's goal for me is to give you a brief overview of some of the main things you need to keep in, keep in mind. So first, it's a free software. It's a browser-based software. You and your students will need Gmail accounts or Google accounts if your school is a Google school. Second, this allows your students to create Android apps and only Android apps. One of the questions that I hear at the beginning of every year is, okay, if my students create an app, will that run on an iPhone? The answer is no. Because Android apps are specifically designed for Android OS. So iPhones run on iOS, Google phones run on Android OS. At some point in future, App Inventor team is working on a cross-platform version where you create one and that the same software can be deployed to both iPhone and Android, but that is not ready yet. The other thing that you will probably want to know is like this getting started button. So again, when you get to the main MIT App Inventor page, there are various buttons up top. So this Create App button is going to take you to the App Inventor App Creator tool. If you need to know more about okay, how to set up App Inventor one time, this Getting Started button, and then Set Up Instruction. So again, I will do that again. The way I go to App Inventor is I just Google for App Inventor or MIT App Inventor go to the link. If I'm creating apps, I'll click on the Create App button. If I'm starting out, I'm setting up my classroom, maybe my school's IT person needs more information on how to set up this Getting Started, then Set Up Instruction. So ideally, you want so this App Inventor runs in a browser in a computer. It can be a Windows desktop, it can be a Windows laptop, it can be a Mac desktop, it can be a Mac laptop, it can even be a Chromebook. So you create the app on your computer, then you test it out either on a tablet or on a phone. If you don't have a tablet or a phone, there is an inbuilt emulator that you can use to test it out. Having said that, having a tablet or a phone is, of course, a really good experience for your students. Now I'm going to go ahead and unmute you all and wait for maybe a couple of minutes to see if any of you have any questions so far or not. So I just unmuted you all. So if you have any questions so far, go ahead and ask. And again, there is no dumb question. Feel completely free to ask whatever you want. Don't be. My um, question is: um, Do we? Is there anything that our IT department needs to do to set up our students' Chromebooks? That's a good question. So here is the instructions for Chromebooks. So. What you might want to do is point your IT person to this web page saying, hey, can you please take a look at this and see if anything needs to be done or not? So okay. I don't know how the Chromebooks are set up exactly, but feel free to forward this to them and they, will, they should be able to take it from there. There are a few 
things that needs to be done. And this is the step-by-step -step list. Good um, yes, I have a question. Yeah. About um, so related to that point, um, I've had a terrible time getting my students the software that they need. So for uh, MIT App Inventor, they to use the emulator because some of my students don't have Android phones; they have iPhones. Correct. So you have to download the AI2 starter. Yes. And. And because of the privileges on their school computers, mm -hmm. um, they have been stuck because our IT department found a way to remotely push the software. Yeah. And even them trying to access to download that, that, that system has not worked because they still haven't been able to, to uh, get the software that they need to, to use MIT App Inventor. So I'm wondering, is there is part of this competition providing um, like tablets or something for the students that you to to use? I will do a couple of things. So first, and this happens every year to some school district or the other. So your school district is definitely not the exception. A lot of the times, I have talk to school district ID percent person or if there's a more complicated question reason on why the emulator is not running the MIT team has all often helped figuring that out troubleshoot that so feel free to contact me if you need some more troubleshooting help at this point coming back to the tablet question I do not know the answer, so I'll defer to Serena on that point. Serena, do you know if there is any way they can request a tablet? Yeah, usually in the summer, you know, when we send out the applications uh, for the new year, um, and part of that instruction is there is a, a grant that Lenovo offers every year um, for a certain number of tablets and, and laptops. Um, if you know, feel free to reach out to me afterwards. We can talk about it um, and we can see what we can do. But definitely, you know, let me know um, if you want to talk offline about that. Okay. Good. Good questions. Other questions so far? Um, I have a question. Go for it. Um, no, first, sir. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll let you ask your question first. Oh, no, I'm just going to piggyback and thank you. Um, I know, Gloria, um, we work in the same district, and I know, I think the, the it, um, thank you for answering that question, because I know right now it's, we're talking about the MSO, which are the online kids, and that's been an issue with me, too, even with Unity. It's like, you know, pushing things remotely that can be done, and, and some kids can't, don't have transportation to get to the school. Right, and, and this year is going to be a weird year. We all know that. Which, um, this kind of leads me to my, um, other question because yeah it's the same issue um with my students as far as some of them do have county issued uh tablets but of course they will not they will not let them download anything and i was kind of curious um i'm also teaching code.org is any of this similar to that to where they can um at least use that in the meantime until I guess we get uh, this issue solved. So uh, this is not, I mean, the, the programming ideas are of course similar because it's programming. It's kind right. of like knowing driving and then like di using different cars. But this is App, App Inventor beyond that similarity is not similar to code.org. Now, let me go back to a question. You said that your students have tablets from the district. What tablets do you know? Is it um, an iPad or an Android tablet? Uh, okay, I know that they're Dell. They're, okay, they're they're really type of um, tablets. I believe they're Dell tablets. Okay, so it might either be a Chromebook or it might be an Android tablet. It might might. No, it's not. No, it's not Chromebooks. Yeah, the um, Miami they don't issue the students Chromebooks. No. Okay, so if it's an Android tablet, that means they don't have. So the Android tablet. They can probably design it on a tablet, but I think it's it's easier to have a computer somehow. 
with the proper keyboard and touchpad. So that is going to be an issue if they have if they have only tablets. And, I mean, they do have a keyboard hook uh, um, that could connect to it, but essentially, it's a tablet. Right. So I'll have to look a little bit and see if if the development can happen in an Android tablet. I don't know, honestly. Like when I use the term browser based, I mean a browser running in a laptop or a desktop. So I'll have to look that a little bit. And and I understand this year with COVID, it's, there are going to be unique challenges, some of which will be really difficult. I understand that and I, I appreciate everything that y'all are doing for your students and some of it will just be beyond our means for this year. Sorry to see. Yes, and I, I just wanted to add that, you know, it, it, it's been for us, uh, computer science technology teachers, it's been so uh, frustrating and difficult and even our IT departments are overwhelmed. So yep. we'll ask them to, you know, do something and, you know, we won't hear or they'll come back with a solution that doesn't, doesn't or partially works. Yep. Uh, so we've been having to, you know, like uh, manage and I had my kids designing an app and and trying to enter a competition and, and we, we couldn't, no one could enter the competition because we couldn't get the software that we needed. That's really unfortunate, but I know that's happening. Yep. But I, I appreciate your sharing this. I'll continue to talk offline to Serena and others and see if there are other resources that can be leveraged to help your students out. But but I also acknowledge that this is a tough year. Other questions? So let me actually start working on an app just so that you see what the process is. And have some more idea of, OK, how to create an app. So when you click on the create app button, that's going to take you to a screen which will look like it. it's going to look something similar to this. So mine has a lot of projects. Your students, when they log in, they're going to have a blank list. So as you can see, there are start new project button. So I'm going to start a new project, 2020 NAF Project 1. So I want you to think about the Google Maps app on your phone. I am sure all of you have used a Google Map. And I want you to think about the process that you go through when you are using that Maps app. Let's say you want to go to a specific restaurant. So what do you usually do? So I want you to stop for 30 seconds and think about what you do. You don't have to answer me, you don't have to say anything, just in your mind, think about what you do when you need directions to go to some restaurant using Google Maps. So when I use Google Maps, if I'm going to a restaurant, I usually pull up the app. Then there's typically a search bar up top. I touch that search bar. A keyboard pops up from the bottom. I type the name of the restaurant, hit enter. Google Map displays me that restaurant. So let me actually 
show you that what I'm talking about. So I'm going to now pull my phone. So I'm actually casting my personal phone onto the screen. Can you all see my phone now? Can one of you please confirm if you can, if you, if you see my phone or not on the screen? Yes. All right. So here is the Google Maps app. Let's say I want to go to There's a barbecue restaurant close to my house. So I type that. It shows me the direction. Then I can click on this directions button and it's going to show me route options and things like that. So this is a very common app experience that all of you have seen. Now there are two distinct aspects of this app. One is the look and feel. And the other is the interaction that happens. So let me go back. So when the Google map pops up, here is what you see. It kind of shows you a map of the current location. So that's called the user interface. That's the visual aspect of the app, things you see on the app. And then when you touch something, I just touched the search bar up top and type something. That's when you're interacting with the app. That's when you are doing something with the app. That's the action that's happening. So in any app, at a very top level, that is the main subgroups that are there in an app. You have the visual aspects and then you have the interaction aspects. That's true for if you are designing an app using App Inventor. That's true if you are designing an app using Android Studio. Android Studio is the professional tool to design Android apps. That's true if you're using Xcode to design iOS apps. So when you create an app, this first screen that's called the designer screen, and that's where you get to build that visual aspect of that. So if you look at the top right corner, you will see that you have the designer button, which is clicked right now, and then you have a blocks button. If you click on that blocks button, this other editor will show up, and this is called the blocks editor, where you build the code of the app, you build the logic of the interaction that's going to happen with that. So in the designer app, there are four main columns. You have this leftmost column is called palette. That content contains various visual elements that you can add to your app. This middle screen is the viewer which shows you the current status of the user interface of your app. Whenever you add new components, they show up in the third components column. And for each component that you have added, there are various properties that you can change. And that last column is for properties. So I'm going to go ahead and drag a button. So as soon as I drag the button from my user interface drawer of the palette, a button now shows up. Now notice this button was added under this screen. There's a little bit of indentation going on here, which signifies that this button is contained within this screen. So I can select anything that I have added. So the screen is added by default. An app has to have a screen. So everything is under a screen. And then we can add more things. So the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to create an app called Hello Cody. So if you go to the App Inventor website, so in the main App Inventor website, there is this tutorials block, this tutorial style. In this tutorial style, for the beginner's level tutorials, 
Well, now the first tutorial is Hello Cody. So what this tutorial is all about is having this MIT logo of the B show up on the screen. And whenever you touch that logo with your finger, it's going to make a buzzing sound. So that's the goal of this Hello Cody app. So for this app, we will need a picture and we will need a sound. So I have already right clicked in this tutorial has a link to a picture that we can use. It has a link to an MP3 file that we can use. I have already right clicked and saved it. So I had right clicked and saved linked as and then saved it in my downloads folder. So if I go to my downloads folder, I'll see that there is a B sound and a Kodi picture. So in my designer window, I added a button. What I'm going to do is I'm going to now change some of the properties of the button. So I want you to think about all the properties that are showing up. So my button is currently selected. I want you to think about the properties right now off the button and just think about what property I might be changing if I want to display a picture. So just think about that. So as many of you probably correctly guessed, of all these properties, the image property is the one we are going to use to change the picture of the button. Right now, the button doesn't even have any pictures. So I clicked on the image property, and that lets me, right now it's saying, hey, you don't have any images uploaded for this app. So go ahead and upload a file. So I'm going to click on that Upload File button. Look for the image that I have downloaded onto my computer. Select that, hit OK, and that's going to automatically change the width and the height of the button to make the image show up right. Now notice this text for button one text is still there. Let's say we want to get rid of that. Again, whenever you are trying to change something related to an, a component, you go to that corresponding property. So as you can probably also guess, the text for button one, that's my property to change. And in this case, since I don't want any text, I'm just going to select the whole thing and delete it. And as soon as I delete it and hit enter, notice that change is reflected in my screen. Let's say I also want some kind of a prompt to give to the user, letting them know what, what they need to do to the app, with the app when they're running this app. So you might be wondering, okay, I want to add, your students might want to be adding some text. Now, all these components, you see there are lots of components out there. And initially, when your students are starting out, it might be overwhelming for them. They, they, of course, can't know what all these things are about. So an easy way to learn more about each component is ask this. Click on this question mark button next to a component, and that gives you a brief overview of what that is about. And if you want to know more, click on the more information, and it's going to tell you more about that. So a label, that's a component that displays a piece of text. So I'm going to drag a label now. I'm going to change some of its properties to make it look a little different. I'm going to maybe make the height a fixed value. 30 pixels or something. I'm going to maybe make the 
font bold. So some of these properties are properties that you can check or uncheck, like whether it's bold or not. Some of it these are properties that you can specify a value. Some of these are properties that you can set from a list of options. So I can also make the width match the width of the parent component, which is the screen. And I can change the text to say some kind of a message. Now, if you were if your students were following the tutorial, the tutorial at this point will say, all right, so you have created the visual part. Now we need to add some components to add the sound part. Now, before we do that, I'm again going to stop. And I am going to let you all ask questions. All right, so again, complete, feel completely free to ask questions. So now that we are talking about adding a sound part, if your students are trying to guess in the palette what, com what component they will be using, they will probably correctly guess that it's gonna be under the media. Now, under the media, when they go and look at the different components that they can add from under the media, many of them will actually use the player. So the player is a really good component that lets you do a lot of things like play, pause, all sorts of things like that. Sound is actually a simpler media component that lets you do some of those things and we are going to use the sound component here. So the main difference between the sound and the player is mentioned here. Sound is best for short clips, while player is more efficient for longer sounds, such as song. So since over here we just want to play a short sound, we're going to use the sound component. So now notice as I drag and let it go, that component gets added as a non-visible component because we are going to hear the effect of this component, but we're never going to see anything. That's why it got added as a non-visible component. So now the sound component, we have to now connect this component, give this component an actual sound file to play. And that's this source property. So if we click on that, you'll note, we'll notice that the picture is there listed, but we don't have any sound. So I'm going to, again, upload it, look for the sound that I have already downloaded. That's this B sound. I'm going to select that, hit OK. Notice as soon as I did that, that file was uploaded under this media part, and the sound is set to source. So this completes my designer part of this app. I have created the user interface. I have added all the media that I want to use. The next step will be to create the interaction, make the app smart, make the app interactive in the sense that when the user clicks on that button with their finger, make that sound noise. So I'm going to, again, wait for maybe, I know we are running a little short on time. We have 10 minutes left. So I'm going to maybe wait for 30 seconds to field some questions. And then I'm going to go to the blocks editor to show you how to design the code. I have a question. So when you uploaded that sound file and you uploaded it from source, could you have also uploaded it from the media section where it says upload file? Yes, absolutely. In fact, a lot of the times when the students get used to this interface, they will first download all the sounds that they want to use, all the pictures that they want to use, and upload them using this upload file. 
instead of doing it that way. It's it's absolutely an, an option. In fact, that's probably what they're going to use once they get used to it. I didn't want to mention that because you still have to, once you upload the file, that just uploads the file into this app. It doesn't set that property. So I did it that way so that both of the things are taken care of. So if you just upload the file, you might think, you know what, that's it. But no, you have to, the app, the com all computers and, and smartphones, all of them are really dumb. They are not smart. We have to make it smart. So we have to change the property. Even if, if we do upload file, we have to come here and change the property to make that connection saying, hey, here is your source file. Otherwise, the app will not run right when you are executing it. Okay, okay thank but, you. So let me now go to the blocks editor. This is where you come to create the behavior of the app. So over here in blocks editor, and we are going to go over all these blocks in future webinars, during the training, as your students are learning more things using the tutorials. But for now, you'll see that there's this screen one option and that lists all the items, all the components that I have added. So if we click on button one, that's going to show me some of these events. So any app is an event driven software, meaning you do something to the app and in response, the app does something. You, in Google Maps, you touched on that search bar and the app opened the keyboard. So you touching on that search bar was an event. And then the app responded to that. So all mobile apps are event-driven apps. So for any component that we add, there are going to be a bunch of events that we can respond to. So over here, we are going to make our app respond to the button.click event. So when your students start thinking about apps and designing the blocks, that they, sh they should be starting to think in terms of that event action sequence. So what is the event? What's the corresponding action? That's how they should be thinking about it. So when you think of the event, and then you go to that corresponding component, drag that event out. And then you think of the action and you look up for that action course in the corresponding component and put place that within the event. So over here, your students might be thinking, okay, the event is user touching the button. So that's related to the button component. So they're gonna go there, they're gonna drag this event. Now they should be thinking, all right, in response to this event, the action should be playing the sound. So that is related to the sound component. So they will go there, they'll look for an action. So events are usually this yellowish, orangish colored blocks. Actions are typically this purple colored blocks. And then you have the green blocks. Those are corresponding to all the properties that that component has. So when you are running the program, when you're running the app, there might be an app where you're changing the background, changing the color of a button. So at that point, you're gonna be using one of these blocks, the background color block. So right now, for button.click, you want your sound to play. So you're gonna to go to your sound component, then you're gonna look for an action that you want. You're gonna place that. So this completes my code. So now I'm going to go ahead and test it. So I'm going to again cast my phone. So in my phone, I have this MIT AI2 companion app installed. This is the app that your students' phones or tablets need in order for them to test out the app that they have designed. This is live testing, meaning you're not installing the app on your phone. You're just running it to check it out. So what you do is you go to connect in App Inventor. You select the AI companion. That shows you this QR code. Then you go to your 
phone, you click on the MIT AI2 Companion app, click on the scan the QR code button, and then I just scanned my screen. Once you scan my your screen, that's when the app is automatically going to show up on your phone. See, and right now, seeing my phone. So let's test it out. So I hope you heard that sound. That was when I clicked on that B picture. So if your students don't have a phone, then this emulator is going to be an option. Now, having said that, as others were mentioning already, the emulator is a pretty heavyweight software. That, so what happens is when professionals are designing apps, the apps are expected to work on all sorts of devices, right? So they have to test it out for each different device. And you can't expect the professionals to have hundreds of different types of Android devices and phones. So what they do is they use the emulator to emulate de different devices. So the emulator that ships with App Inventor, that's a professional grade software, so it's resource hungry. So sometimes students have issues running it. So that's why if they can have a basic phone or a basic tablet, even the Android tablets, sorry, the, the Amazon tablets, which at times at the Amazon tablets have really good deals on them. You can get it for 40, 50 bucks. Those work too, and those are really good tablets. So this is just a brief overview of the Hello Kodi tutorial that's there on the App Inventor website. So if you go to App Inventor, and then if you go to Tutorials, the beginner level, the first tutorial is Hello Kodi. And I wanted to show you all that tutorial and kind of go through it just so that you have a feel for what the whole process is. So we are almost out of time. So I'm going to stop here and field questions. So ask questions. Hello. Go ahead. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. My name is Evelyn Soto from South Dade Senior High. Hey, so if you have the hi, if you have the event handlers, those event handlers are the mustard ones, the blocks. If you have the green ones that are properties, yeah. then the purple ones would be for what? And are they considered the commands, right? Yes. Actions. Commands, actions. All right. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. The no other problem. thing is if, if we have MP3 files and we yeah. have the WAV files, yeah. right? They'll work. So is is there any any in particular that need to be matched with the play button or the sound button? Yes. So in that that connection was done in designer where I changed the source to pick one of those sounds. So whatever I select here, whenever the play Whenever the player that sound dot play block executes, whatever is selected there is the one which is being played. Okay, so you said sound is short. Uh -huh. So um, if it's long, player. then you use the play button. No. But is there any? There's no no mix and match here when it's when it, when it comes to a wave or or MP3. So you can mix and match. It's just that you will have to select the. Each time when you are, and this is a really good question, but each time your, if your app dynamically needs to change the file that they're playing, then you will have to go to the sound, change the source property within the code to some other file. And we are probably going to explore some of those options later, but that's a little advanced feature. Certainly do yes. you'll, be, yes. you'll be changing it before playing, if that makes Are sense. Are you going to be working with uh, creating blocks to put together the creation of blocks? Yeah, so I, I might, I don't know. Usually what happens during these webinars is I devote 
the initial part of all the webinars answering questions. So that's kind of like free flowing where whatever question comes up, I answer them. And then there's usually invariably time left. And I have uh, one of, I explain an app like this where I grow, go through creating an app or just having an app open and explain it. And I'll be more than happy. I, I don't really, I don't set the agenda for the whole year right away because I feel like we need to have that flexibility to respond to teacher needs as and when they come up. So what you are talking about is creating custom blocks. Those are called procedures, this procedure. So you can create your own blocks. And if that's something that we have, I have talked about in other years, not every year, depending on what the teacher's needs are for that. And I can certainly do that this year, but that is going to come a little later because we need to know a few more things, I feel like, before we can really start understanding creating custom blocks. But good question. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. No problem. Others ask questions, please. For the tablet, you were talking like the Amazon Fire? Uh-huh. OK. Serena, do you have any last minute comments? I don't think so. But you know, I, I made a, a comment in the chat that you know we definitely want to hear of any issues or roadblocks that might be coming up. You know because of just how you know strange and uncertain this year is going to be so definitely you know pass along those comments to either me directly or you can even post them to the google group because pretender gets access to that as well um so we just want to make sure we can support you to the best that we can and you know make sure it's easier for your students as well because i'm sure they're frustrated trying to do this at home and probably not the way that they're normally using or doing this in the past so definitely flag anything bring it to our attention and you know we can see what we can do the, uh, the Amazon Fire tablets that I was talking about, the cheap ones, the, that's this. It's it's the forty the $50 one, that'll work. Now, again, just to clarify, that'll work to test out the app, to install the app. Development ideally still needs to happen on a Windows laptop or a Windows desktop or a Chromebook or a Mac laptop or a Mac desktop. So this is for testing out the app, running the app, not developing the app. And Krishnandu, I don't know, I know we're at the end, um, but maybe if, do you have any tips on, you know, if students are kind of doing this all on their Android phone, if how that can be done or if there, if that's something that could be an alternative? I will look up some resources and try to share that in the Google group. But I think it's going to be a not a good experience for the students if they try to do that. I mean, of course, given this year's limitations, that's what might be happening, but I'll, I'll try to take a look at that and get some more resources and share that with you. Great, thank you. All right, well, again, let, I'm, I'm Excited to have all the new teachers here. Hopefully you all will continue to attend the sessions. It's basically every two weeks from here now up till March. And even if you can't, we will have these available on YouTube. So feel free to contact me as well. Let me put in my email address at the, in the chat box. So feel free to contact me as well if you need any other offline help. With that, let's stop here today. You'll have a great night and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Have a great night. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you very much.